Hi everyone and welcome to the fourth episode of the Cancer Researcher podcast from the European Association for Cancer Research. In this episode, let's talk about grant applications, we will discuss about research funding and you've guessed, grant applications. I am your host, Dr. Alexandra Boitor, scientific officer at the EACR and a former early career researcher myself. And my guests for this episode are Dr. Ryan Schoenfeld, CEO of the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research, a philanthropic organization dedicated to transforming the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of cancer around the world. An experienced scientific leader, Ryan oversees the foundation's scientific programs, investments and operations. Dr. Greg Hannon, Professor of Molecular Cancer Biology and Director of the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute at the University of Cambridge, who has recently won a grant from the Cancer Grant Challenges offered by Cancer Research UK and the National Cancer Institute. And Dr. Ariana Bagiolini, Assistant Professor at the Institute of Oncology Research in Switzerland. She recently obtained an SNSF starting grant for her research a funding scheme in Switzerland covering the ERC starting grants as well as the former SNSF funding schemes Excellenza and Prima. Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today for a new episode of the Cancer Researcher podcast. Oh, <laughs> great to be here. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks for inviting us. Yeah, yeah hi everybody. It's very cool to be here. Uh, today we are discussing applications for cancer research funding, and I have here with me two winners of prestigious research grants and the CEO of the Mark Foundation to tell us more about uh, how grants for researchers work. Yeah, thank you for having us here. Uh, you know, I think everybody, when they have to transition from a young researcher in a lab uh, to try to become an independent PI, there is always that moment of unknown, right? Uh, except you had the chance maybe to work with your previous PI in one of the applications. It's hard sometimes to exactly know what to expect during a grant application. So I'm really happy to be here and discuss about this. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, any listener um would probably at least have thought about applying to a grant, if not already tried some successfully, others maybe not so successfully. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, I think the main question is, where do we start and how long in advance should one start preparing for a grant application? So maybe I can comment on this. I think that there are many answers to this. Um, one is you think about the scope of the application, it's size because I mean I think there is no one thing such as such as a grant application, right? You go from you know quite small awards to things like the Cancer Grand Challenge, etc., and they all take different levels of preparation. So the other thing is, you know, say, it depends on how fast you write. Um, I, I always think that the hardest part, and the part that consumes the most time, is actually formulating the questions and approaches. And I guess for myself, I find that, you know, if I do that, I can sort of write, you know, a couple of bullet points on a whiteboard, then I can produce a coherent document in just a couple of days. Uh, I think the other end of the spectrum, so I lead one of the first year funded Cancer Grand Challenges back in 2017, but also Welcome Trust Leap Project and have done other big things. Um, you know, is that, that preparation for that spans months because you have to, assemble teams. Yeah, Ariana, go ahead. No, yeah, I totally agree with Greg that it really depends on the level of your expertise and the type of grant that you are planning to apply for. For example, if you are a young researcher, let's hypothesize a, a postdoctoral fellow, you definitely um, need a lot of time to plan ahead because most likely you're also not going to work on the grant application 100% of your time. You are probably um, working on your ongoing project. So I would definitely recommend, you know, I, I think it's not being extreme to start thinking about, at least in my case, was a case one year ahead, just because sometimes you might already have an idea in your mind. Um, some other times you don't have already an idea built in your brain and you need time to become creative, uh, check whether you have the technology and the know-how 
to address a question that passionate you and look, as Greg said, for eventual collaborators. So you need to have time, you know, to collect some preliminary data, maybe pitch your idea uh, to potential collaborators. And then uh, actually the writing part probably is the shorter part um, in all the process of getting a grant ready. And especially for young people, the, the first part, it really takes a, a lot of time. Yeah. Um, also really to think of what you want to do for the next four or five years of your career. Yes. I'll just add one, one thing. This doesn't speak to the time for, for planning, which I agree can be very, it's highly variable. What Greg said, especially whether it's a team project or an individual project, I'm, those things can really affect the time, but just to comment as someone who, who reads a lot of grants and also who puts together our organization, creates calls for proposals. And we think deeply about what we want to ask people to put into a grant application and why. I think the first thing I'm looking for in a grant application of any size is understanding of the question you're trying to answer with a grant, whether it's a small grant or a large grant, what's the question and why does this matter? What will, what will happen next after this work? If these questions are answered, where will it lead? So, I mean, those are the hardest things I think to think through, but they're the most important. And if you can, that should come through in any grant application of any size. Yeah. And I, I think just to pick up on what Ron said, um, I think that for most people starting out, they make the mistake of saying, okay, I'm going to apply for this call. And then they try to start writing. Yeah. Right. Where that, you know, is, I agree that probably the shortest phase of the process um, I'm not sure I ever prepped a year in advance, but, you know, I, I think again, it very much depends on where you are in your career. Um, but, you know, generally you're always walking around with a few ideas in your head, perhaps not quite completely formulated. And then, you know, you see a call that they fit for that sort of focuses your mind, focuses your attention, forces you, um, you know, to really put together a plan. Like people hate grant writing generally, but I actually always thought it was a really good exercise and a really good way to kind of focus your thinking. And so I always felt like I had much better control over a project once I'd written an application than sort of going into the process. I tend also to encourage, you know, certainly all the people in the lab, if it's students, it's fellowships, but Postdocs, you know, I'll very often write a grant with a postdoc. And I suppose I'm building on my PhD experience, postdoctoral experience where my mentors did that with me. Um, and I've got plenty of postdocs who are actually co-PIs on grants. It's, that teaches them not only the sort of grant craft part of it, but it also teaches them you know, sort of all the soft skills around, you know, how do you write a lay abstract? How do you prepare a budget? Um, and then how do you administer the grant afterwards? Of course, with ChatGPT, none of us are ever going to have to write grants again. But I think in Europe, countries are moving to outlaw ChatGPT, so we better keep the skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you mentioned funding as well. I was wondering, if you were to narrow down, what would be the stages of planning for writing a grant proposal? So far, I think we have formulating the question and a few main ideas. And then uh, Ariana mentioned um, contacting potential collaborators. And Greg, you've mentioned uh, trying to think about how the funding would be devised for each application. Yeah, and I guess then also try to collect some preliminary data to try to understand whether um, your idea are potentially really interesting also in reality. And that probably is one of the most exciting parts of the project because you're really, um, you know, trying to put something uh, in shape and in actual substance from an idea. So um, nowadays, yeah, it, it's actually really good if you have some preliminary data that shows at least that you have the technology to address the question that you want to address or at least a collaborator that is backing you up for if you are lacking maybe uh, some specific technology or the access to sample or that you have, you know, all the theoretical things that to be successful in pursuing your project. Do you have any suggestions on how could one access some funding, like smaller budgets for preliminary data? I mean, I think it largely depends on where you are. So 
Um, you know, if you're in places that have big cancer centers, uh, there's often some development funds that they put aside specifically for this purpose. Um, if you're a new investigator, you'll often have some funding that comes along with starting your position that lets you put some of this in place. I mean, I think there are also, I think, plenty of organizations that have a concept level grants, which are small, but which, you know, in many cases, not only generate far preliminary data, they forbid it. And so it's just where you look along the spectrum. I think most of us, when we start the process, um, usually have a reasonable amount of preliminary data in hand. The exception might be when you're at the very start of your career, so there you've often collected data during a postdoc that you can use to support early applications. Uh, and then there might be one or two key bits that you fill in. Now, I think in terms of new faculty starting out, there are a lot of different attitudes. And I've heard quite senior people give the advice that, oh, no, don't waste your time writing a grant for your first three or four years. Um, I give exactly the opposite advice because, you know, you come out of a postdoc, you're sort of in a, what we'll call a review honeymoon period, you know, where you built upon all that strength that you've had with the support of your postdoc mentor. Um, if you wait three years, you're at the point where reviewers will have expected some quantifiable output. And I think that that sweet spot in the middle of that honeymoon period is a great place to get your first grant or two. And again, because I don't see it as a distraction, I see it as a way to focus your thinking. Yeah, and then that gives you a little bit more runway because we all know that the amount of time that it takes to produce and then publish a set of results um, is getting longer and longer. Journal expectations are, are rising. Uh, projects are much more interdisciplinary, but more collaborative. If it involves clinical samples, there's often uh, quite a lag there in either finding the right cohorts, um, you know, getting the right permissions in place, et cetera. Um, you know, so, so I strike early uh, with some smaller awards and then use that to build a foundation you know, for looking at something bigger, you know, ERC, et cetera, um, as you get just a little bit more senior in your career. And apart from the support that you receive in writing the grant, are there any other main differences planning wise between preparing for a grant aimed at early career researchers, mid career researchers, or more senior researchers? I wouldn't say that there are major differences. Again, the differences are across the type of project you're trying to build. And I guess the more senior you are, the more likely you are to be building larger, more interdisciplinary, more collaborative efforts, at least as a lead. Um, you know, whether that's the right way, I don't know. It's just an observation that that's what happens. So I think it's much more about the type of application you're constructing than the career stage that you're constructing it at. Yeah, I, I would agree that when we, just to speak to our own grant programs, but I think they're representative of what other funding organizations might offer. You know, there are project-based grants and there are kind of person-based grants. I think they kind of fall into those, those two categories. Even in the latter category, where it's a more individual award for an individual person, the project that's being proposed, the work that's being produced is still really important. But I think there's kind of two different lenses. If you're you know, applying to one of our innovation awards or one of our team science awards, you know, the team is important. Who's going to do the work is very relevant. You know, what the expertise is there to execute on this idea. But the concept itself is first and foremost and what the plan is, right? On an individual award, it's a combination of things, right? Looking for how this award will impact a person's career, especially if it's something an early career award, let's say. And so kind of finding the right way to mix in what's special about this project and this question you want to answer, along with what this funding might mean for helping you kind of move your career forward, right? If you can find a way to kind of shine a light on both of those things. I think those for, for individual awards, especially early or maybe mid-career awards, that probably makes a big difference to, uh, depends on the program, but that can make a difference. And apart from the career stage and the um, geographical area where you are in or where you want to move your lab, what else should one take into consideration when choosing a funding scheme? Well, I always think, it, and I think this is a mistake people make, more than you would imagine. I think you should never write a grant to do something that you d don't want to do anyways, right? Th there is often a temptation, so there's a call for this. Let's see, what can we do? What can we write? I have to confess that perhaps once in my career or so, 
you know, I've done this and then I have tremendously regretted it because, you know, we got the grant and we had to do a project that wasn't really something that was probably kind of in our main areas of interest. Um, so I think the scheme has to match the science you want to do. That would probably be the main thing. Um, the other thing, and you know, I shouldn't say this with a, you know, a granting entity on the, on the line, um, I always tend to look also at the reporting requirements and all this stuff. And I, I have been in schemes and I'm in schemes, you know, where there's sort of much more hands-on management. And then I've been in schemes where it's, you know, C in seven years. And, um, you know, so you have to think about the, the amount of work and responsibilities that you take on board in terms of interacting with the funder. And, you know, while I think being in one program like that is totally fine, if you start to get sort of multiple grants where you're on a monthly call or have a monthly report, then that starts to eat into your time to think and do research. Another question that I have, and this is more targeted towards early career researchers. Uh, when applying for a grant, you obviously need the support of an institution. And this is something obvious and might come natural to more senior researchers. I was wondering how does one have to go about that? How would one approach an institution to ask whether they could be embraced by the institution for a grant application? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think here um, there is definitely a difference often between Europe and the US because indeed some uh, positions for young PI are not core funded or minimally core funded in some European universities. So you have to bring your own uh, starting grant. So there, you know, you have definitely to reach out to the institute where you want to potentially build your own lab, see whether they have an open call and be able and willing to support your application. If you manage to get these, then you definitely have access to the grant office that all the institute have. So there is actually a tremendous help because they can really help you with the structure, you know, of your application. Maybe not so much about the science, of course, that is up to you, uh, but they will prevent you to make basic mistakes. So it's important that, you know, you think about science on one side, but you try to, you know, have your grant ready as early as possible to get some feedback um, from the administrational office as well, from the grant office of the institute where you're planning to open your lab, or if you have already a lab open, then the interaction is even more straightforward. Otherwise, I definitely, you know, recommend everybody, and I'm trying to do it for myself as well, um, to reach out to friends and colleagues, not always that are expert in my field. So some of the best feedback I received from um, scientists in totally different fields. And the reason is that, you know, often reviewers are, yes, expert to some extent in, in the proposal that you are writing, but they are probably not as expert as you. So you have to make sure to build a proposal that is clear and uh, understandable for everybody, for somebody that is also maybe not as specific as you are in a topic. I'll make a comment on your question, but I just want to pick up that something Ariana said, which I think is a really good point. So grants are reviewed by committees. You know, sometimes it's purely on paper, you know, more and more often, I think, there's an interview process. Um, and so you've got a bunch of people sitting around a room. Two of them will probably have read your grant. And they'll be somewhat expert in your area. If you're not doing an interview, more people may have looked at it. Uh, probably not read it in detail. But you've got to convince the whole committee, whether it's purely written or written plus an interview. And so you've got to make it accessible. I think that's absolutely right. And something I think too many people you know, sort of miss as an important factor. Um, in terms of how do you get an institution to support you? So I direct a core funded institute and, you know, we work in the Cambridge system 
um, where very often, yes, there may be a position open, um, but you've got to bring your own money to it again, very different than the situation in the States. Um, and I think we don't yet really have a perfect answer, at least in our place, you know, for how we support our kind of most senior and yet not independent young scientists uh, to go out and, and get that kind of funding so that rather than saying, oh, I'm going to apply and if I get this, I can move to the department of whatever, you know, but have that funding lined up and then take that, you know, as an entree to a position somewhere, right? So, you know, so how can we support someone to apply while they're still internal and still have security uh, and then support them through a transition to independence elsewhere since we tend not to hire internally? And I think it's a real struggle and it's something that, you know, I've been trying to come to grips with when I came from the American system about nine years ago now. Um, been director of the building for just over five. And, and I, I would say it's a real issue with the European system that kind of needs careful consideration and some concerted action. Ryan, is there anything you would like to add? Well, on that particular topic, other than I'm really intrigued to hear what, what you both are saying, because I'm, I'm thinking about opportunities where organizations might be able to make an impact and fill a gap, right? And because, you know, we, we, we have some control over the way we shape our program. So I'm inspired to look in to think about that more. Um, otherwise, I would just totally concur with Ariana and with Greg supported too, with that making your grants accessible to a, let's say it's different than the lay abstract, right? These are experts in different adjacent fields. So they're highly scientific, but, you know, so you can still be technical, but you got to be accessible. It's a very delicate kind of balance to try to strike and but that can be the difference in whether a grant because you know, greg's abs absolutely right when decisions get made they get made by a group of people and the two people who read your grant how well they articulate to the rest of the committee basically what stood out to them in the grant and they're able to do that better if they're able to articulate you know if they have accessible kind of language to pull from readily that they can share with the with the group so that's that was really i think powerful good feedback good actionable feedback for anyone who's looking for it yeah, it's interesting, Ryan, from the perspective of a, I think, if I understand it correctly, global funder, yeah. um, you know, looking for how to fill those gaps, I think is really important. When Michelle Cleary was with the Mark Foundation, um, I, I had a lot of conversations with her around where the gaps are. And I think from a funder's perspective, that's really important. I think it's very heartening yeah. that that's the approach yeah. you guys are taking. Absolutely. We're always trying to find the best way to make our funding impactful, because even though it's a substantial amount of funding in the grand scheme of cancer funding, it's a relatively small amount. So we want to make sure that the impact of what we're doing is there. And it's not just incrementally funding just a little bit more of what didn't make the cut here and there. We want to try to do something a little more to fill gaps that exist, right, that are being fully missed and to, yeah, to do things that are a little different. Yeah, so Michelle was a great, a great inspiration for me, for sure. We had many conversations as well about planning to do that going forward. And a bit earlier, Greg, you've mentioned that in certain cases, not everyone present at the interview for the grant might have read your uh, grant proposal, or then sometimes reviewer just skim through it. And I was wondering, uh, which is the most important section of the grant that someone has to put maybe just a tiny little bit more effort in to get it polished to drag attention to their proposal? Page one. So the summary. <laughs> well, so at least if I think about NIH format, it's abstract and specific aims, right? That was always page one. But whatever the grant is, it doesn't matter what's on page one. Page one is the only opportunity you have to hook the people who are not specifically assigned to your grant. If they're not intrigued by the bottom of page one, you're not going to get the grant. And do you have any tips on how you could make your abstract and your aims uh, stand out? Um, okay. So accessibility, um, I think clarity of expression is often linked to clarity of thought. You know, really giving a very punchy summary of, you know, okay, so what's the question you try to answer? Why is the question important? Why are you the best person 
in the whole entire universe to answer that question. And how are you going to do it? And then at the end, you know, what's the impact? What, what's going to change because you've been funded to carry out that project? And I think if you hit those points, then, you know, you've given yourself your best opportunity to convince the referees. But I think Ryan might have something to say from the other end. I don't know. No, th those are great points that I, I agree. If you got it, you got to pull somebody out on page one. I don't know why, but I saw a documentary not that long ago about it, about like Motown, right? Which is where they made all these hits, the hit factory yeah. in Detroit. The way that they kind of engineered these hits, one thing that was like in the first some number of seconds, I forget what it was. So in the first 10 seconds, if you're not, it's not going to be a hit, right? You got to be pulled in. And I think Greg's right. You got to, there's got to be something there, but that something could be different. It could be, it could be the question you're asking, or it could be so, something that clearly comes across that's exciting, that pulls you in. It's about the problem, about the researcher. It's really going to vary by grant and by mechanism, et cetera, but you got to be pulled in. I completely concur. And for me, that's usually the other question. I want to see on the first page what the question is you're trying to answer and what, why does that matter for cancer, for patients, for research? I want to see that clearly on the first page and get excited about it. Thank you very much for all your answers. This has been a very interesting conversation. Um, we look into, into having another episode to continue our conversation. And I want to thank all of you for sharing your views and your advice. So thank you, um, Ariana, Greg, and Ryan. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. We really hope that you enjoyed listening to Ariana's Greg's and Ryan's advice inspired by their own experiences submitting or receiving grant applications. I would like to once again thank our guests for being here with me today and many thanks to everyone who listened. Don't forget, the EACR also offers some funding opportunities for postdoctoral fellowships, for short visits to other labs and financial support for attending conferences in addition to a series of awards that celebrate excellence in research. Visit www.eacr.org slash EACR fellowships for more details. That's www.eacr.org slash EACR fellowships. Please do us a favor and tell your friends about our podcast. And don't forget to tune in on the 12th of July for the next episode, where we will discuss the importance of networking for career progression and research excellence. You can give us feedback or offer suggestions for other topics or preferred guests through our feedback form that you can find on our website at www.eacr.org slash podcast. That's www.eacr.org slash podcast. And don't forget that you can also find us on Twitter at EACR News, Instagram at HelloEACR, and you can search for us on Facebook and LinkedIn.